Topic 8, Origins of Genetic Variation, 8.1, Genetic Information. In Topic 2, we learnt about meiosis, and here you can see the centrals move into opposite poles, and when they pull apart, they form microtubule spindle fibres, and these then attach to the homologous chromosomes, and they pull the homologous chromosomes to opposite poles, so we've got reduction division, we've ended up with haploid cells starting to form with the nuclear membrane around both sets of chromosomes and here's myosis 2 forming with the same thing happening again but in myosis 1 there was crossing over between non-sister chromatids which increases genetic variation and we end up with four genetically different daughter cells and these daughter cells are clearly going to be haploid and here we could describe how myosis results in haploid gametes from topic 2, we can see we've got mysis 1 and mysis 2, and just like mitosis, mysis 1 is made of PMAP, prophase 1, metaphase 1, anaphase 1, and telophase 1, and then the same idea for mysis 2, prophase 2, metaphase 2, anaphase 2, and telophase 2. And in mysis 1, as I mentioned, it's a reduction division because the homologous chromosomes split and move to opposite poles, and therefore the number of chromosomes halved, and that's where haploid cells start to form. In prophase 1, you also had crossing over of non-sister chromatids that increases genetic variation. In anaphase 1, the homologous chromosomes are separated, but in anaphase 2, it's the sister chromatids that separate, and you end up with four haploid gametes produced from diploid cell, so therefore the chromosome number is halved, and therefore you've got four genetically different haploid gametes. Explain how mysis results in genetic variation. So, this is from topic 2, but also in topic 8. And we can see here there, there are three ways that myosis results in genetic variation. So as mentioned in myosis 1, in, you've got crossing over. So crossing over recombination happens in prophase 1 of myosis 1. And here homologous chromosomes line up, the chiasmata forms, and there's a break in the DNA of non-sister chromatids. You then have the exchange of genetic information, and this results in new and different combination of alleles, which are the recombinant chromosomes then forming. Another form of genetic variation through meiosis is the possibility of the fact that the chromatids of each chromosome can move to opposite poles there's a 50, 50 chance of which poles they move to. And so different chromosomes, because they come in pairs, could move to opposite poles, whether they're from maternal or from paternal. This is known as independent or random assortment, and it happens in metaphase one and results in different combinations of chromatids. And then lastly, there is contribution of DNA or genes or alleles from two individuals. This is at the end of meiosis when you produce gametes. And because all of these gametes are different and there's contribution of DNA or genes or alleles from two individuals, this is known as random fertilization. Meiosis, which is involved in sexual reproduction, is a source of genetic variation which allows organisms to adapt to changes in the environment. In topic one, we learned about protein synthesis. And one of the things we learned about protein synthesis is the gene has a sequence of bases, which we make a copy of in transcription. And that DNA genetic code is now in mRNA, which is a copy of the gene. And then codons within the mRNA code for specific amino acids. And that forms a sequence of amino acids, which are then joined together with peptide bonds to make the polypeptide. So effectively, the sequence of bases in a gene determines the sequence of amino acids that are formed in the polypeptide. And because of these polypeptide having a specific sequence of the amino acids. So this is something we learned from topic one, which is also in topic eight. Explain the term point or gene mutation. That's when there's a change in base sequence. 
So the example that we saw previously in topic one here, we can see that the cytosine base has been deleted. So there's a base deletion. In the next example, we can see there's an addition of guanine as a base insertion. Whereas in this example here, we can see the cytosine base has been substituted for thymine. So this is a base substitution. And we should then be able to relate the consequences for changing the amino acid sequence due to point mutation. So understanding the fact that when you've got a base addition or a deletion, in other words, an insertion or a deletion, that causes a frame shift in all of the bases. So therefore, you end up with complete change in all the amino acids. The replaced amino acids is due to substitution. However, it could have no effect if the mutated codon codes for the same amino acid after substitution due to the fact that there's degeneracy of the code. Obviously, shorter polypeptides can form if there's a stop codon because translation ends sooner, no more amino acids added. The whole effect is that there's going to be a different amino acid sequence or primary structure because there are different R groups of those amino acids involved. Therefore, there are going to be different types of ionic hydrogen disulfide bonding, and that alters the folding of the polypeptide chain and the type of secondary tertiary quaternary structure. So these are how mutations have an effect on protein. And so we learnt about protein structures here and the fact that they could make ionic hydrogen disulfide bonds. So if you have different amino acid sequence, the R groups will be different, and therefore the folding of the protein will be different. And that will then have an effect on the protein having a different structure. And obviously the shape determines the function, so it's really important that you maintain the shape, but any changes in the shape due to the change in the protein structure affects the function. And sometimes this function can become inactive, or they can be silent, or it could change to a different form, which results in additional phenotypes. Another type of mutation is chromosomal mutation. Again, we learned about this in topic two. So explain how chromosomal mutations occur, including Downs and Turner syndrome. So here's an example of a mutation. And we can see that some part of the chromosome has broken off and joined another chromosome. So this is known as translocation. So here, part of a chromosome breaks off and joins another non-homologous chromosome. Obviously, if it was to join a homologous chromosome and they're completely exchanged, there'd be no changes. And then there are two types of translocation. You've got unbalanced translocation. And you've also got balanced translocation, where there's a complete exchange between two non-homologous chromosomes. So the map that's been exchanged has been balanced. Another form of chromosomal mutation is non-disjunction. In non-disjunction, there is a failure to separate either the homologous chromosomes or the um, sister chromatids. So homologous chromosomes in only phase one or sister chromatids in only phase two fail to separate, and this results in gametes with either two copies or no copies of that chromosome. Effectively, the zygote or the somatic cells are aneuploidy due to having an abnormal number or abnormal total number of chromosomes. And the examples that we need to know are Down syndrome and Turner syndrome. So in Down syndrome, there's non-disjunction of chromosome 21, and that results in gametes containing two chromosome 21 instead of just having one. So therefore, when it fertilizes with another gamete, you'll end up with three chromosome 21, which is known as trisomy 21. And that's also known as polysomy because there's more than the two copy expected in a fertilized egg or zygote. For Turner syndrome, this is non-disjunction of sex chromosomes. And here, there is no sex chromosome X or Y in the sperm. So if there's no X or Y in the sperm, the only sex chromosome comes from the female. So therefore, it's just X chromosome on its own. So we could say XO genotype if that comes from the ovum, then it's monosomy because there's only one sex chromosome instead of having the um, healthy amount of two. Now, when we look at these chromosomes, we learned previously that they come in homologous pairs. And that's because one copy of the, each of these homologous pairs come from the mother, 
and the other copy is inherited from the father. Effectively, if you were to inherit a brown allele from your mum and a brown eye colour allele from your dad, you would express brown eye colour. However, what happens if you inherit two different alleles from the parents? So a blue eye colour allele from the mother and a brown eye colour allele from the father. The quick answer, do you express one brown eye colour and one blue eye colour? Or is it half brown, half blue in both eyes? Or maybe it's blue in the centre and brown on the outside, vice versa. So this relates to the dominance of the allele. So we're going to explain genetic inherited keywords. And so we can use this diagram when we're looking at the height of pea plants, which was studied by Mendel. And we've got lots of keywords here. So first of all, we've got a gene. A gene is just a sequence of DNA bases that codes for a particular protein. So we know that from protein synthesis. In this case, we're talking about the stem length gene. The locus or loci is the position where a gene for a particular characteristic is found in a chromosome. So in this case, the stem length gene or the stem length alleles are found in chromosome 4. So that would be the locus for stem length. An allele is a different variant or version of a gene. So for stem length, you could have the tall allele or the dwarf allele. They're both different variants or versions of the stem length gene. The phenotype is what you physically or chemically express in an organism. So the characteristics, whether they're physical or chemical, that make up the appearance of an organism. So in this case, we're talking about the pea plant height. That would be the physical expression from the stem length gene. Whereas the genotype would be the genetic information that is in the alleles that results in the phenotype. So you could have two capital T's that would represent having two tall alleles. You could have a capital T and a lowercase t. Therefore, you've got a tall allele and a dwarf allele. Or you could have two lowercase t's, therefore two dwarf alleles. Homozygote is when both alleles coding for a characteristic are identical. So if you've got two tall alleles, therefore you are homozygote for the tall allele. However, you could also have instead two dwarf alleles and because those two dwarf alleles are the same, you could also say these are homozygote. So you could be homozygote with the tall allele, you could also be homozygote for the dwarf allele. Heterozygote is when the two alleles coding for a characteristic are different. So in this case, you'd have to have a tall allele and a dwarf allele, because then both alleles would be different to each other. So the zygosity is hetero, so it's heterozygote, they're different. Dominant allele are the alleles that are always expressed, whether the individual is homozygous or heterozygous. So in this case, the tall allele is dominant. We write that as a capital T. They're the ones that are always expressed as long as one of them is present. But if you have both present, then clearly in a homozygous form, it's going to be expressed. But if you have one tall allele and one short allele, the tall allele is expressed, so the tall allele must be dominant. That means that the dwarf allele is recessive. And recessive alleles are only expressed when there are two copies of the recessive allele that codes for that characteristic. So in this case, the pea plant could only be a dwarf in terms of its stem length for its height when there are two dwarf alleles or two recessive alleles, which are the dwarf versions or variant. In other case, two lowercase t's. So using that example, we can see here that we've got three people with different eye colors. And in person one, you've got the phenotype brown eyes, because that's what's being physically expressed. Person two has also got brown eyes, but person three is expressing blue eyes. If we then look at their genotype, for well, person two, they have got one brown eye allele and one blue eye allele. So the genotype is capital B, lowercase b. In person one, they've got two brown eye alleles, so it's capital B, capital B. 
and person 3 has got two blue i alleles, so lowercase b, lowercase b, since they're recessive. And then in terms of describing those genotypes, we could say that for person 2, because both alleles are different, clearly they are heterozygous because they've got a brown eye allele and a blue eye allele. However, person 1 has got two brown eye alleles, and because those brown eye alleles are the same, that means that they are homozygous, and the brown allele is the dominant allele because they're always expressed, so they are dominant homozygous. And uh, we know that because in the heterozygous, where the person has got one brown eye allele and one blue eye allele, they're expressing brown eye. So that's how we know the brown eye is dominant. For person three, they've got two blue eye alleles. So again, this is homozygosity as well, because those two blue eye alleles are the same. However, the blue eye alleles are recessive. So this is recessive homozygous. Now we could use Punnett squares to look at the possibility of inheritance, which you should have learned in GCSE. And in Punnett squares, what you want to do is you've got the two alleles and then you want to segregate them because only one of them is passed or inherited to the offspring. Only one 50-50 chance of passing along to a gamete. And that's both in the gametes of the male and the female. And then pre-fertilization, you can look at the different combinations, which there'll be four different types. And some of those four different types will clearly be the same um, genotype, which would cause the same phenotype as well. So when doing Punnett squares, we want to know what type of um, disease, whether they're dominant or recessive. And examples you could have done in GCSE are dominant disease such as Hunter's disease or recessive disease such as cystic fibrosis. And Hunter's disease is dominant disease because only one dominant faulty alley is required to express a disorder. So whether it's having one dominant allele or two dominant allele, that disease is being expressed. In this case, Hunter's disease. Whereas in cystic fibrosis, having the dominant allele means that you are healthy. So therefore, cystic fibrosis is a recessive disease. You need two copies of the cystic fibrosis allele to express cystic fibrosis. So two recessive faulty alleles are required to express the disorder and the phenotype. However, if you have one cystic fibrosis allele and one healthy allele, you are heterozygous and that makes you a carrier. So that doesn't mean that you express the disease in the phenotype, but because you have one faulty allele and one healthy allele, that means there is a possibility that you can pass on your faulty allele to an offspring. Obviously, that would be a 50% chance of passing it along. So we're going to look at the difference when you construct genetic crosses, just like you did in GCSC. And what is the probability of an offspring expressing genetic disorder when crossing two heterozygous parents, whether it's a dominant disease or a recessive disease. And the first thing you want to do is to start off with a three by three box. So those are the results of both the dominant disease and the recessive disease. You would start off with your parental genotypes and there'd be two alleles in both parents. And then you'd have to segregate the alleles into the a genotype of the gamut, and that would be obviously a 50% chance of either allele, 50-50 chance of gametes containing one of the allele or the other. So example of this would be um, if we're looking at a heterozygous Huntington allele, there would be a capital H and a lowercase h, so you'd have to segregate them. That means the gametes 50% chance of having a capital H, the Huntington disease allele, and 50% chance of having the lowercase h, the healthy allele. So only one allele in the gamete, and then that gamete will fuse with another gamete, and therefore you'll end up with two alleles for that gene after fertilization. This means you could then come up with the offspring gene type, and you could then analyze these offspring gene type to look at the probability. So since there are four boxes in a Punnett square, you could then predict the possibility of expressing a genetic disorder after looking at the combinations 
pre fertilization Now, when the combination produces two different alleles, you should always write the donor allele first before the recessive allele in heterozygous of an offspring genotype. So, for instance, in the example of Hunter disease, where you've got a capital H from one parent's gamete and a lowercase h from the other, after fertilization, you should show the offspring genotype as capital H, lowercase h, because you always write the dominant allele first before the recessive, not lowercase h, capital H. It's really important to do that when constructing genetic cross crosses. And if you look at the results of the dominant disease and the recessive disease planet squares, you can see the percentage probability of offspring expressing genetic disorders are different. So in Huntington's disease, is 75% when you're crossing two heterozygous parents. It's a dominant disease, so that you only need one of the alleles to be expressed, one of the dominant alleles to be expressed to have the disorder. However, uh, in cystic fibrosis, because it's a recessive disease, you need two copies of the recessive, the faulty alleles, to express it, the disorder in the phenotype. So if we've got two heterozygous parents that are being crossed in the Punnett square, the probability is only 1 in 4, which is 25%. And the exams, you're more likely to write the probability as a percentage. But sometimes it's also acceptable to write it as a fraction or a decimal instead. So the percentage is more common. Now, when we look at Mendel's experiment, he experimented on pea plants. And a tall pea plant, which is the phenotype, could either have the genotype capital T, capital T, or the genotype capital T, lowercase t. In other words, it could be homozygous dominant or heterozygous. So how do you find out if your tall P plant or dominant uh, phenotype is a homozygous dominant or a heterozygous? And this is important for plant and animal breeders. And what they do is they do a test cross. And when they do a test cross, depending on the results, you can determine whether it's a homozygous dominant or a heterozygous because you're test crossing it with a homozygous recessive and that will produce different results. So if we test cross a homozygous dominant with a homozygous recessive, we would get 100% tall offspring. In other words, 100% of the dominant phenotype in the offspring. So this will tell you that your original plant or animal is a homozygous dominant when expressing the dominant phenotype. However, if it was heterozygous instead and you were to cross it with a homozygous recessive, that means 50% of your uh, plants would be tall and 50% would be dwarf. Or if we're looking at other phenotypes or characteristics, half of them would express the dominant allele and half of them would express the recessive allele. So therefore, that would be proof that your original organism, plant or animal, was heterozygous when expressing the dominant phenotype. Now, a long time ago, scientists believed that variations in parents blended or fused together in offspring. So for instance, if you had a white flower and a purple flower, the idea is you'd end up with a pink flower. So you'd have a blended or fusion of both offspring. And we know that's not true based on Mendel's experiment. So if you look at Mendel's experiment, what he did is in experiment, Mendel crossed two pea plants of different heights. So in other words, a tall pea plant with a dwarf pea plant. And the offspring produced all, were all tall pea plants. He then cross-spread two of those tall pea plants from the offspring. And when he did that, he found that some of the pea plants were short, which is weird. Is where did they, um, how did the short or the dwarf pea plant inherit the dwarfness? So variations suddenly appear, which can't be explained by blended. In other words, you can't, the, the idea that if you have tall plants and a tall plants, they should blend and all be tall. In this case, there were some dwarf pea plants.
So Mendes showed characteristics don't blend, the offsprings weren't intermediate height. And we know for, uh, from modern genetics that what he did cross was a capital T, capital T with two lowercase t's, so a tall pea plant with a dwarf pea plant. And if they were both homozygous, so homozygous tall with a homozygous dwarf, clearly the offsprings would all be heterozygous. They would still express the tall gene. And when they express that tall, or the tall allele, and when they express that, when you cross two of them together, that means that you'd end up with a quarter with two capital T's, half them with a capital T lowercase t. So in other words, three out of four, three quarters of all the pea plants would express the tall um, allele. However, 25% or one in four would express the dwarf. So describe the work of Mendel in discovering the basis of genetics and recognizing the difficulties of understanding inheritance before the mechanism was discovered. So when Mendel was doing these experiments, no one knew about inheritance through DNA. And he summarized his three laws as each gamut receives only one factor for a characteristic. And if we look at that, we don't call that one factor anymore. We know that we're talking about a gene. So in other words, gametes will receive one gene for a characteristic. We know that for every gene, there are two copies, but only one of them will be passed on or inherited through the gamete. The version of a gene, well, if we're talking about a factor, we know that for versions, these versions of genes are clearly alleles. So the allele of a gene, is the gamete receives is random and does not depend on other genes in the gamete. So in other words, genes do not have influence on other genes of different characteristics in terms of what's been inherited. If you have a certain eye color, that doesn't mean another um, characteristic such as hair color is determined by that eye color being inherited. And some alleles of a gene are more powerful than others. And instead of using the word more powerful, we obviously understand that as being more dominant than others and always have an effect in the offspring. So they're the ones that are always expressed. And just to see, we learned about um, variations in blood types. So we've got blood type A, blood type B, A, B, and O. In this case, you could see that these uh, red blood cells erythrocytes have antigens on the surface. These antigens have got different shapes. They're made of proteins. They're on the cell surface. And you could have A antigen, B antigen. If you've got blood type AB, you have both the A antigen and the B antigen expressed. But if you're blood type O, you don't express either of them. However, what happens if you have blood type A and B when you're expressing both? Well, shouldn't one of them be more dominant than the other? Shouldn't you express A or B? So why would you express both alleles? In this case, blood type A allele is inherited from one of the parent, in this case, the dad and blood type B allele is inherited from the mother. So you should be expressing the dominant allele. Is it A or B? In this case, both alleles are expressed because it's blood type AB. So we call that co-dominance. That's when both alleles are being expressed. They're both dominant. And when we look at the alleles in this case, there's the IA allele, the IB allele, and the IO allele. And the A and B versions are clearly the dominant alleles, and the O is the recessive type. Again, you would have two of these alleles, one of them you'd inherit from your father, and one of them you'd inherit from the mother. So blood type AB, you've got the IA allele inherited from one parent, and the IB allele inherited from another parent. But both alleles are expressed because both A and B are co-dominant. So again, you should have learned this in GCSE, where if you've got a phenotype blood group of A, you could have two different gene types. You could either have IAIA, where both IA alleles are the same, so therefore it is homozygous. But because the IA allele is dominant, it's homozygous dominant. You could also have a gene type of IAIO, and that's because the IA allele or A allele is dominant over the O allele. 
In this case, the two alleles are different, so it's heterozygous. For blood type B, it'd be exactly the same, but with uh, B allele instead of A, so it'd be IB, IB. Again, this would be homozygous dominant because the B allele is also dominant, just like A, they're co-dominant. You're going to have IB, IO. Again, this B allele is dominant over the O allele, so this is heterozygous because there are two different types of alleles, but the phenotype would be B, because that's what would be expressed as its dominant. For a phenotype of AB blood group, the gene type would be IA, IB. Both of these alleles are expressed, so they are co-dominant. They're heterozygous and they're co-dominant. Heterozygous because the alleles are different, co-dominant because they're both expressed. Whereas to express blood type O in the phenotype, the gene types would have to be IO, IO. Both of these alleles are the same, so they're homozygous, but the O allele is recessive, so it's homozygous recessive. We could then use this information for Punnett squares of blood types. So in this case, we're talking about um, blood doing Punnett squares with multiple alleles. So what are the possible gene types of offspring from these parents? We've got blood group A and blood group B. The blood group A is heterozygous expression blood group A, and the blood group B is also heterozygous expressing blood group B. So we've got IAIO and IBIO. And if you've got an IA and an IB in the two gametes, when they fertilize and fuse together, they do not form IAB. We know that the blood group will be A and B, but there is no allele called AB. So that is wrong. It should be IA, IB. Everyone has two copies of these genes. So IA is one copy from one gamete. IB is another copy from another gamete. So the classic mistake in the exam is to write down IAB. There is no allele called IAB. Even though the blood group is called AB, the two alleles are IA, IB. And then if we look at the other combinations or offspring genotypes, we could then um, ex talk about the expression of these genotypes in the phenotype. So IA, IB is clearly blood group AB. Then we've got IAIO, which is blood group A, because A is dominant over O. Blood group IB, IO forms the expression of blood group B. And then the gene type of IO, IO forms blood group O when expressed. And then if you look at the combinations, you can see there's a 25% chance of each blood group when you've got a heterozygous blood group A and a heterozygous blood group B in a Punnett square. The ABO blood groups inherited uses codominance and multiple alleles. If we're trying to explain how ABO blood group alleles illustrates dominance, recessiveness, and codominance, we know that A and B are dominant over O, whereas O is recessive. And because when A and B are both expressed, they are codominant. So explain terms, multiple alleles, and codominance. Multiple alleles is when there's more than two possible variants of a gene. So you can have IA, IB, IO, but there's no such thing as IAB. Make sure you remember that for the exam when you're doing Punnett squares. Whereas codominant is when both alleles are expressed. So in other words, IA, IB in the gene type is expressed as AB in the blood group. For the multiple alleles, there are more than two possible variants, but only two are inherited, one each from the gametes. If we look at different examples, obviously in eye color we saw earlier you could have brown eye allele or blue eye allele. So there's only two types there, but multiple alleles have more than two possible variants. So in blood groups you've got IA, IB, and IO. We've looked at the zygosity based on the phenotype and genotype and done a Punnett square. So moving on to work of Mendel on genetic inheritance. And we looked at Mendel's um, three laws earlier, and we want to mainly focus on the first and the second law. So Mendel's first law is his law of segregation. So we know that there'll be two copies of every gene or two alleles of a gene 
and those two alleles will then segregate when forming the gamete. So an allele for each trait is inherited from each parent, so only one, not both alleles from both parents. One allele will be inherited from both parents, and that gives a total of two alleles for each trait. So segregation, which is another way of saying separation of alleles, in each pair takes place when gametes are formed. So when forming the sperm or the egg, only one of the two alleles are passed on to the gamete, but then when these gametes fuse together, because there's one each, they'll join together to make two alleles of a gene in the offspring, in the zygote. Mendel's second law. His second law relates to independent assortment. And this obviously happens in metaphase one, resulting in different combination of chromatids. Different traits are inherited independently from each other, i.e. inheritance of a dominant or recessive phenotype of one characteristic in other words, grey or ebony bodies in Drosophila has nothing to do with inheritance or alleles for other characteristics such as wing length or eye colour. So we have this understanding that what you inherit out of the two alleles for one gene has no effect in what you inherit for the other allele for another gene. However, there are some exceptions and we're going to learn about gene linkage and polygenic inheritance also. All of the Punnett squares you've done so far are monogenic crosses. An example here, we've got a round heterozygous P crossed with another round heterozygous P. The round is the dominant with wrinkled being the recessive. And because they're heterozygous, one of the parents will have capital R, lowercase r, and those two alleles will then segregate in the gamut. The other parent is also heterozygous and their two alleles would also segregate and this will result in a Punnett square where the expected ratio or segregated ratio is a 3 to 1 expected ratio. Explain inheritance of two non-interactive unlinked genes. So how can we look at the inheritance of two genes that are not linked to each other? What would their segregated or expected ratios be? So in this characteristic we were looking at the shape of the P. So we've got round and wrinkled, but what happens if we looked at another characteristic and try to combine them together? So another example could be the colors of the P. So you could have green or they could be yellow. So therefore you could have a round yellow piece, you could have wrinkled yellow piece, round green piece or wrinkled green piece. How would then they then be inherited? So if we're just looking at the heterozygous version of round and yellow, because round and yellow are the dominant, for round in heterozygous it would be capital R lowercase r, and for yellow it would be capital Y and a lowercase y for the green allele, with the capital Y, the yellow allele being expressed. And when we're looking at the inheritance of these four alleles, When there is segregation, the round allele and the wrinkled allele move to opposite poles, and so will the yellow and the green allele. So you could end up with a gamut with, that has got the round and yellow allele, and another gamut that has got the wrinkled and green allele. But what happens if the yellow and green allele move to the other poles? Therefore, other combinations you could have are round and green alleles and wrinkled and yellow alleles. So effectively, there are four different possibilities from the combination of a round and yellow heterozygous P. So if we were to put that into a Punnett square, those are the possible gametes that can form. So looking at those possible genotypes in the gamete, we then produce a digenic cross. So this is a larger cross. And in this example here, we could see that there will be two different alleles in each gamete because we're looking at two genes. And each of those gametes are for the two different genes. So we've got the shape, which is round or wrinkled. There should be one allele for that in the gamut, and then the other allele would be eye colour. So both of these 
alleles are for different characteristic. And then if we look at the combinations that they form, we see that the expected ratio or the segregation ratio is 9331. Just like we've got 31 expected ratio for two heterozygous in a monogenic cross, in a diagenic cross with heterozygous, the segregated or expected ratio is always 9331, with 9 being the phenotypic expression of the dom both dominant alleles or the dominant alleles for both characteristic. 3 is the dominant allele for one gene and the recessive allele of the other gene and then three would be the reverse so it'd be the recessive allele of the first gene and the dominant allele of this of the second gene whereas out of the 16 combinations one out of 16 would be the recessive alleles of both genes so the segregation or expected ratio is always 9331 when we've got inheritance of two non-interactive unlinked genes that are heterozygous for both parents. So how would you do these diagenic crosses? It's always a good idea to do one of the gene first and then the other gene when you're looking at the fertilization. So in this case it'd be a good idea to write the capital A or the lowercase a together first and then you'd do the same for the other gene and then you'd look at what is being expressed for all of those 16 probabilities and the expected ratio is always 9331 if both parents are heterozygous for both characteristics. Calculate chi-squared value to test significance of difference between observed and expected results. So when doing chi-squared we've got this equation chi-squared is the sum of O minus E squared, so O is observed, E is expected, you do observed minus expected, and then you'd square that, and then you'd have to divide it by the expected, and you'd look at the sum of all of those. So here's an example, we're now looking at Drosophila in terms of the wing and body, so two different non-interactive genes, their wings could be either long or vestigial sh shape, and their bodies, they could have grey body or ebony body. And the hypothesis, based on the Punnett score we've done previously, is that there should be a 9-3-3-1 ratio. And then we've got numbers that we are observed. To get the expected, we know that there are 16 different combinations. So we looked at all observed and we find the sum of the observed. So the sum of the observed is 176. And then using the ratios, we know that 9 out of 16 should be the dominant. So 9 16th of the 176 is 99. That is what is expected. 3 16th of the 176, which is 33. And we've also got, again, 3 16th of the 176, 33 for that phenotype. And the last one for the recessive alleles for both characteristic, there should only be 1 out of 16 and since the total is 176 organisms that are being observed, it will be 1 16th of 176, which is 11. And then looking at chi squared, we've got our observed minus our expected. We squared that, divided by the expected, and then we find the sum of all of that. And we can see that we've come up with the value of 0 0.282. Now to see how significant this is, we need a degrees of freedom. And degrees of freedom is the number of phenotypes minus 1. So here we've got four different phenotypes and we minus it from one. So four minus one is three. That is our degrees of freedom when we look at the statistical table. So here is what we're going to compare it to. We've got our degrees of freedom of three. And we always use a probability of 0 0.05, 5% chance results are random. Our chi-squared value is 0 0.282. So when we compare that to degrees of freedom of 3 with a probability of 0 0.05, we can see that is 7.82. And our highest squared value of 0 0.82 is lower than 0 0.05 probability value of at 3 degrees of freedom, which is 
therefore it's not statistically different. In other words, there's no significant difference between the expected 9331 ratio and the observed results. So we do get results that are similar, they're statistically similar to the 9331 ratio. So remember, when we're doing the statistical test for chi-squared, we're looking at the 5% chance of the results being random. So therefore, we have a cutoff point of 95% statistical significance threshold. Explain autosomal linkage results from presence of alleles on the same chromosome and that results of crosses can be explained by events of meiosis. So in this example here, allele for smooth seeds, A, is dominant to allele for wrinkled seeds, lowercase a. Allele for purple seeds, capital B, is dominant to allele for yellow seeds, lowercase b. State all the possible gamut genotypes of heterozygous smooth purple grain, capital A, lowercase a, capital B, lowercase b. What are the possible alleles that could be in the gamut? So clearly using... Mendel's law of segregation, you could only pass on one of the alleles for each characteristic. So if we've got capital A, lowercase a, only one of them could be passed on for one gamut. And then capital B, lowercase b, again, only one of them could be passed on to each gamut. So if we look at all the combinations, we clearly have capital A, capital B. So in other words, you could have a smooth seed that is purple. We could have capital A, lowercase b which is the smooth seed that is yellow. We can have lowercase a, capital B, wrinkled seed that is purple, and lowercase a, lowercase b, the two recessive alleles, wrinkled seeds that are yellow. Those are all the combinations that can be produced in the gametes from the gene type of a heterozygous smooth purple grain. Alleles of two different genes, in other words, smoothness and color of seed, they should segregate independent of each other based on Mendel's law of independent assortment, which states that inheritance of a phenotype of one characteristic should not influence the inheritance of alleles for another characteristic. In other words, it should have no effect. What you inherit for one gene should not affect what you inherit for a completely different gene. And we could prove that because we've seen that when we cross two heterozygous, we see a 9331 ratio. So 9331 ratio when crossing two heterozygotes are both characteristics. However, there is an exception, and that is gene linkage. So sometimes genes are linked to each other and they don't follow the 9331 ratio when you cross two heterozygotes. So we're going to know what gene linkage means. And gene linkage is when genes are very close to each other on the same chromosome. So alleles of two different genes located close together on the same chromosome, they tend to be inherited together during meiosis due to gene linkage. And this is proved by the 9331 ratio not being observed. So if you've got two genes that are very close to each other, in other words, there's locus is very, very close to each other on the same chromosome. Therefore, when the chromosomes, um, the chromatids or homologous chromosomes move to opposite poles, they would, the two genes that are close to each other, clearly they're going to be inherited together. We know crossing over could happen between non-sister chromatids of homologous chromosomes, but because these two genes are so close to each other, the chance of crossing over happening between them is very small. Therefore, both genes that are independent of each other, these genes are not related to each other, they could both be inherited together. And that increases the possibility, and therefore a 933 one ratio is not observed. If you've got both genes in two different chromosomes, clearly the alleles of two different genes located on different chromosomes have 50% chance of being inherited together, in other words, moving to the same pole. So the first chromosome might move to one of the poles, the second chromosome could move to the same pole or can move to an opposite pole. There's a 50% 50-50 chance, and that will follow Mendel's law of independent assortment and because it follows it you would get a 9331 ratio in that circumstance what happens if the alleles of two different genes are located on the same chromosome but they're a lot further apart so because they're located in the same chromosome that means that 
it's not like the second example where you've got a 50% chance. It will not follow 9331, but there is a possibility of crossing over happening between them so that those two genes, or alleles of those two genes, are clearly going to be on different um, sister chromatids that will then move to opposite poles. And because they move to opposite poles, that means that they could be close to 9331 or they will not follow the 9331 ratio. So they are less likely to be inherited together due to more recombination happening between both genes. So they won't fully follow the 9331 ratio, however, it would not be too different to it. So linked genes are genes that are inherited together with other genes as they're located in the same chromosome, whereas unlinked genes are genes that are located further apart. The linked genes are always in the same chromosome because they're close to each other, whereas unlinked genes can be on the same chromosome but really far apart, or they could obviously be in different chromosomes. The linked genes are very close together, whereas unlinked genes are very far apart. The linked genes do not undergo homologous recombination, but unlinked genes do, therefore the linked genes are inherited together, whereas unlinked genes can be inherited together, but their chance of it being inherited together is very small. The chance of inheriting together is more than 50% for linked genes, whereas less than 50% for unlinked genes. The linked genes do not follow Mendel's second law, the law of independence inheritance, whereas unlinked genes do. Therefore, if you were to do a dihybrid ratio, you would get a 3 to 1 ratio for linked genes, have, because it would be similar to a monogenic um, Punnett square or monogenic cross, whereas in a dihybrid ratio for unlinked genes, it will be a 9331 ratio. And if you were to do a test cross, remember we learned about test cross earlier with crossing it with a recessive. So if you crossed it with a recessive alleles of both genes, the test cross would have a 1 1 ratio for linked genes, whereas a test cross with a dihybrid would have a 1 1 1 1 ratio. So in other words, there'd be more phenotypes expressed, whereas there's only be two phenotypes expressed, or that could be expressed out of all the gametes when they fuse into together in fertilization to form the offspring. So the offsprings could only form two different phenotypes for linked genes, whereas unlinked genes, they could be all four phenotypes can be expressed. And we can see that as an example here, we've got a linked test cross and we've got an unlinked test cross. So in the linked version, we've got two genes. We've got the wild type and the black vestiginal. They're very close together on the same chromosome. Whereas in the unlinked test cross, we've got a wild type and black vestiginal that are on two different chromosomes. If we test cross the unlinked genes with a homozygous recessive, that's what we do for test crosses. We can see that you could have four different combination of phenotypes in the offspring, and they'll follow the 1 1 1 1 ratio. Whereas in a linked, where you've got two linked genes that are on this very close to each other on the same chromosome, you would not follow the 1 1 1 1 expected ratio. That's how you know that they are linked. When you do a test cross with a homozygous recessive, the vast majority would be two of the phenotypes. The other two would be in much smaller numbers. They would, they would still be ex expressed. They would still show up because there would still be some recombination or crossing over happening in between the two genes. So just to make that clear, if you were to do um, a homozygous crossing with another homozygous, for an unlinked two genes, you'd get a 9331 ratio. But if you were then to test cross it with the homozygous recessive, you'd get a 1111 ratio. Whereas the linked two genes that are linked to each other, because the two genes are very close to each other on the same chromosome, you'd get a 3 to 1 ratio when you cross two homozygous. But if you cross that with a homozygous recessive, you would get you would not get the 1 1 1 1 ratio. You're most likely to have the period two phenotypes being expressed, but you'd have a few of the recombinant phenotypes, a very small amount due to 
a few crossing over happening between the two genes that are linked. Okay, in GCSE, you would have learned the difference between a male and female in terms of their karyotype. So you can see in the sex chromosomes, males are XY and females are XX. And if we were then to look at the probability of an offspring having a sex that is either male or female, we know that is then 50-50 or 50% 50 chance. So chromosomes come in homologous players and that includes the sex chromosomes. So they come in either XX if you're female or XY if you're male. That is the homologous pair, those sex chromosomes. Now, if you are a female and you've got two X sex chromosomes and they're both healthy, then clearly you're going to express the healthy allele. But what happens if you have a faulty allele? If that faulty allele is recessive, you still have a dominant allele in the other X chromosome, the sex chromosome, that is going to be expressed if you're female. However, what happens if you are male? In the male, they have a Y chromosome where sections of the X chromosome is missing. Because they're homologous, those alleles are not found in the Y chromosome, but they're only found in the X chromosome. And because males are XY, that means they'll only have one copy of those alleles, because the other copy is missing in the Y chromosome, only for that section. Therefore, they will always express what's on the X chromosome, what they inherit from the mother. If the mother passes on a faulty allele, that means they would have to express the faulty allele because the Y allele does not contain, or the Y chromosome does not contain an allele for that gene. That gene is missing. So this link to sex-linked genetic disorders. In this case, we can see that in the Y sex chromosome, some of the genes are missing that are found on the X chromosome. Therefore, there's only one allele, and that allele is in the X chromosome, and it will always be expressed if you're male, is your XY. The Y chromosome has got a missing allele, so the X chromosome allele for that part of the section must always be expressed, and if it's faulty, if you've inherited from your mother, you will always express it. However, females are XX. If they have a faulty allele that they inherited either from the father or the mother, they would then express the healthy allele from the other sex chromosome, the other X chromosome. They could only express the faulty disease if they have two copies of it. So in other words, you'd have to inherit from both the father and the mother and therefore their chance of doing that is a lot less than for males. And these are known as sex-linked genetic disorders. So they're more common in males because they only need to have one copy of the faulty allele, which they clearly inherit from the mother. They don't express any of those alleles from the Y chromosome because that section of the Y chromosome is missing. Females need to have two faulty alleles to express it, one from both parents, whereas males only need to have one copy. However, females can be carriers and pass on the faulty allele if they do have one of the faulty allele. They would express the dominant allele, the dominant healthy one, but the faulty allele would be the one that they can steal 50% chance of being passed on to their offspring. So they can be carriers. So if you look at sex-linked genetic disorders, you learned from GCSE that one type of sex-linked genetic disorder is color blindness. So an example here, these are what red, green, color blind people see, and they can't see some of the colors, but a person with regular vision can see colors when we look at red, green, color blindness. So here's a Punnett square that we've done in GCSE for sex-linked genetic disorders probability for color blindness and if you look at the mother's gamut if we look at the mother's gene type first the mother's gene type is x capital r x lowercase r and then because of segregation only one of those sex chromosomes would then be passed on inherited in the gamut 
this mother is clearly female because they've got two X chromosomes. And because they got a capital R and a lowercase r, in terms of their gene type, their phenotype, therefore they are carrier. So they can pass on the colorblind allele. Because in the father, the father's sex chromosomes XY is male. And there is no allele listed next to the Y chromosome because that section is missing. So therefore, the father only contains one allele that they inherited from the mother. This is a capital R, so it's the healthy allele. So this is a male that is healthy. And then, obviously, looking at the gametes, the probabilities from if the gametes were to fertilize, what would be the probability for the offspring's genotype? Obviously, we know that there's a 50% chance of being male or female. But in terms of the color blindness, in the first one we can see is X capital R, X capital R. So it's female, this is XX. But capital R, capital R means that this person is healthy. In the next one, we've got XY, so that's a male. And the X contains the R allele, so this is healthy. Then we've got female, which is capital R, lowercase r. So in this case, this is a carrier because they are carrying the colorblindness allele, which they can then pass on to their offspring. However, they're not going to express the colorblindness because they've got a healthy allele, which is the capital R, which they inherited from one of their parents. Whereas in the last um, probability, we've got XY. So again, this is male. In this case, the X chromosome contains the lowercase r allele, and there's nothing in the y, y chromosome. So therefore, the lowercase r allele must be expressed. This is color blindness. So that means that this male expressed color blindness. So here's another example of sex-linked genetic disorder in a plant square. In this case, we're looking at hemophilia, which we also did GCSE. In this case, we're using the letter H, so capital H for healthy and lowercase h for the recessive disorder haemophilia, or the haemophilic allele. And obviously there's no such thing as a male carrier, these males are XY, so therefore the Y is inherited from the father. So explain the difference in inheritance of haemophilia by males and females. If the Y is inherited from the father, the X must be inherited from the mother. Because there's only one allele on the X chromosome and no allele on the Y chromosome, either you express the healthy allele that is inherited from the mother or you express the faulty allele that is inherited from the mother. It can only be whatever's in the X chromosome that is inherited from the mother. Therefore, males cannot be carriers. So males inherit the allele, whether it's the healthy or the hemophilic allele from the mother in the X chromosome because the Y chromosome has that section missing. Whereas in females, they have to inherit a faulty allele from both the mother and the father because it's a recessive disease. So that means you need to inherit two recessive alleles, two hemophilic alleles. And so there is a lower probability of inheriting two faulty alleles, then inheriting one from the mother. So male only have one allele for this gene, whereas females have two. So females only express the disorder if they inherit it from both parents, whereas males only inherit, express the disorder if they inherit it from the mother. So explain sex linkages on X chromosome, including hemophilia in humans. So as we said, we've got the Y chromosome is missing this section of the X chromosome, this means that males, XY, have only one allele for some genes on X chromosome for those missing parts, because these genes are missing on the Y chromosome. If allele for one of these X chromosome genes are faulty, then males express the genetic disorder. So they will express the faulty allele that's on the X chromosome in this section that they would inherit from the mother. We looked at hemophilia, female heterozygous are carriers. They contain one faulty and one healthy allele, but they don't express the disease in the phenotype. However, their offspring can inherit the faulty allele. 
and then we've looked at a um, a Punnett square, in this case a male haemophiliac with a female haemophiliac, we can look at all the possible combinations, explain why more men than women are colorblind. So males inherit one X chromosome, recessive allele will always be expressed in males, the females inherit two X chromosomes, so if they inherit one recessive and one dominant allele, the recessive allele will not be expressed. They need to inherit two recessive faulty alleles to express the disorder with males only to inherit one from the mother. So they have a higher percentage chance of being colorblind. So we look at constructing pedigree diagrams. And again, this is something that we should have looked at in GCSC. And this is a family pedigree chart we can see here. And this is for genotypes and resulting phenotypes inherited in family for a phenylketonuria disorder, PKU, which is a recessive allele. And if we look at them, when we could see that males are shown as a square, whereas females are displayed as circles. And we then have to look at the key to see how the genetic disorder is shown. So in this case, they're shown with stripes, whereas unaffected is just sh completely shaded. So which letter shows the recessive allele? Obviously, we've got the letter Q, so the recessive allele must be lowercase q. Why doesn't Caroline have PKU? So if we look at Caroline, we can see that she is capital Q, lowercase q. So this is a genetic disorder that is recessive. So if it's a recessive disease, she needs to have two lowercase q. She's got capital Q and a lowercase q. The capital Q is healthy. So she's expressing the healthy allele, which is dominant. What is Brian's genotype? So Brian, we can see, is male with a PKU. So if you've got PKU, you must have two lowercase q alleles. Calculate the probability that Sam has PKU. So Sam is the offspring of Brian and Carolyn. We see Sam is male. Brian is lowercase q, lowercase q. Carolyn is capital Q, lowercase q. So if we were to do a Punnett square, we could then see the probability of Sam being capital Q, lowercase q is 50%. And the probability of being lowercase q, lowercase q is 50%. So the probability that Sam has PKU is going to be two out of four, which is 50%. So this is a family pedigree chart and you should be able to construct one using information that is provided and then be able to analyze it as well. 8.2 gene pools. Describe factors in which allele frequencies remain same over many generations. So here we've got some mechanism of variation, things that could make the allele frequency change. So mutation could be one way where allele frequencies change. So you have a mutation in the basis, this produces a different phenotype, therefore that allele will therefore now be different. So that could cause the allele frequency to change. Non-random mating, which is also known as sexual reproduction, could also cause a change in the allele frequency. If you have random mating, then there's less possibility of allele frequency changing. When it's non-random mating, so there is an advantage on a certain allele, then that allele frequency is more likely to increase in the population, whereas the other alleles will decrease. So that causes an allele frequency to change. Migration, which is better known as gene flow, that also could cause an allele frequency to change. So if you've got migration and you've got the introduction of a different allele, that then has an impact on the overall allele frequency in the population. Other mechanisms of change are genetic drift, where there's a random chance event, and selection pressure, where certain alleles are favorable. That's from natural selection. So which factors? So first of all, having an extremely large population means that allele frequencies are less likely to change because any sort of chance event will have less of an impact. If mating is also random, so there's no uh, advantageous, there's random mating. Mutation being very rare decreases the chance of allele frequencies changing. 
Also, if the migration doesn't have a big impact, does not alter the allele frequency, or doesn't happen, you could also, is the population isolated, you could also say that there could be factors in which allele frequencies keep the same over many generations. Statewide, two populations can have different allele frequencies. So why would two different populations have different allele frequencies in the first place? This could be due to founder effect, which we'll discuss later on, population bottleneck and genetic drift, which is a result of chance. So let's look at genetic drift. So if we've got our original population, then in the second population, say there was an event and a certain group through random would survive, therefore that allele frequency could change and this would then have an impact on the next few generation and you get to the point where allele frequencies of different alleles could suddenly increase and others could decrease in the population. Having a larger population means that the chance of alleles being eliminated or fixed has a lesser probability, whereas in a small population you will see more fluctuations and these allele frequencies could suddenly become fixed as in 100% for one allele and 0% for another them being eliminated. So large population size does have an effect. Explain how Hardy-Weinberg equation can be used to monitor change in allele frequency in population. So the allele frequency in the population, we can look at the frequency of the dominant allele and the recessive allele. And if we look at their frequency, they should equal a total of one. So here we're just talking about um, two different alleles, one dominant, one recessive. We're not talking about multiple alleles. And in terms of their frequency, if we were to add them together, they should equal one. And so we could look at those frequency of dominant allele and we call it P and the frequency of recessive allele, call it Q. So the P plus Q must equal one altogether. So if 60% of the alleles are dominant, therefore 40% of the alleles must be recessive. If we then look at the genotype, so here we're talking about two alleles in combination because there should be two alleles for each gene, one inherited from both parents. The frequency of the homozygous dominant genotype would therefore be P squared. The frequency of the heterozygous genotype would be 2PQ and the frequency of the homozygous recessive genotype would be Q squared. And so P squared plus 2PQ plus Q squared must therefore equal one. Is all of the frequency of the three different types of gene types together would equal everyone in that population, which would be one. So how can we use these equations? Tests on sample of North Americans showed frequency of albinos in population is one in 220,000. Calculate frequency of recessive and dominant alleles plus all genotypes. So here we can see that the frequency of the homozygous recessive genotype. So we're looking at albinos, which is a recessive condition in the population. It's one in 20,000. So therefore one in 20,000 have the frequency of the homozygous recessive genotype for albinos. So therefore it'd be one over 20,000, which is 0 0.00005 or 0.005%, and that would be Q squared. So then if we were to find out Q, we would just square root that, and that would be 0.007 or 0.7%. So now we know what Q is, we can then figure out what P is, because P plus Q equals one. So one minus 0 0.007 equals 0 0.993 or 99.3%. The 99.3% of is the frequency of the dominant allele, whereas the frequency of the recessive allele is 0.7%. And then using that, because we now know P, we could look at P squared, which is the frequency of the homozygous dominant genotype. And so 0 0.993 squared is 0 0.986. So 98.6% of the population have the homozygous dominant genotype, which is the non-albino, but it'd be the homozygous dominant genotype version, whereas the 
frequency of the heterozygous gene type is 2pq, so it's 2 times 0.986 times 0 0.007, which is 0 0.014, that is 1.4%, would therefore be the frequency of the heterozygous genotype. So they would also not have albino. However, they would contain an albino allele. So calculate the frequency of the recessive and dominant alleles plus all the gene types, and those are calculated. So what are the conditions of Heine Weinberg equation? When can we use this equation? This equation can only be used because it can predict genetic disorders, but not health disorders caused by lifestyle. So we're going to look at disorders that are genetic. We're assuming that the frequency of the alleles P plus Q equals 1 remains constant. In other words, there are no fluctuation in those um, allele frequency. And we're also assuming that there are only two alleles for a gene. So in other words, no multiple alleles. We're also assuming the frequency of the gene type remains constant. So P squared plus 2PQ plus Q squared equals 1. So there's no change in the frequency of the homozygous dominant genotype, the heterozygous genotype, and the homozygous recessive genotype in the population. The P squared is the homozygous dominant, 2PQ is the heterozygous, Q squared is the homozygous recessive. We're assuming that there is random mating, therefore no selection pressure. In other words, that because there is random mating, there is no advantages to a certain um, mating. There's no mutation. So in other words, that allele frequency stays the same. There's also no migration in the population, which would also affect the allele frequency. So because there's an assumption that the frequency allele remains constant, we're also assuming that these things that will that can affect the allele frequency, they are also not happening. We're also assuming it's a large population. The small population will have more fluctuations in the allele frequency. And there's an assumption that there's no genetic drift, so random changes in gene pool of a population. If we don't have these random changes, then that's an assumption that so that the allele frequency is not changing. Explain how allele frequencies can be influenced by. So if we look at the first example, we've got a large population, then suddenly that large population becomes small, and then the small population becomes large again, but the allele frequencies come from the small population, so we've lost some of the alleles, so there must have been some sort of event where the large population size turned into a small population size and we're losing a lot of the alleles, so the future large population only comes from the alleles of the small population size. And if you look at the second diagram, we could see that we've got a large population, but then some of them have migrated, so they're the founders, and then a large population comes from the founders, so they are the ancestors, and therefore all the alleles will come from those founders. So allele frequencies can be influenced by population bottlenecks, and they could be also influenced by founder effect. In terms of population bottlenecks, this is when there's a dramatic reduction in population size due to an environmental disaster or a new disease or hunting or habitat destruction. Many of the gene variants present in the original population is lost, and this causes a severe decrease in gene pool and genetic diversity of population, plus large changes in the allele frequency. In the founder effect, is very similar. You've got loss of genetic variation because a small number of individuals have decided to leave the main population and set up a separate new population. So the alleles in individuals who leave the main population are unlikely to include all the alleles of the same frequency as the original population, and if you have an unusual genes in the founder members of the new population, this could amplify as the population grows. So an example of this is Ellis van Creveld syndrome in Amish community. Explain why frequency of disease might be higher in isolated population. So there could be a founder effect, therefore there'd be a very small gene pool or a genetic bottleneck or low genetic diversity or small number of different alleles. Therefore, you're more likely to inherit two recessive alleles or both parents more likely to be carriers or heterozygous. Explain why when population of endangered species has recovered from very low population, many individuals have health problems. So if you've got an endangered species, the population becomes very low, but then even if the population size increases, 
there's a chance of health problems. And this because genetic or population bottleneck causes a reduction in genetic diversity or in gene pool or the number of different alleles in the population. In other words, there's a small or restricted gene pool. So the chance of inheriting two harmful recessive alleles therefore increases when the population suddenly becomes larger. Explain why species may become endangered when population falls to very low numbers. That's because when that happens, there's a loss of gen genetic diversity, there's a small gene pool, so less resistance to environmental change. Or the other issue could be there's difficulty in finding mates, so population growth continues to be affected. Explain how selection pressure against less well adapted phenotypes or alleles changes. We could change the allele frequency or the genetic diversity or the gene pool in a population. So here we've got some examples of how phenotypic frequency can change for any given trait or characteristic. So the first example, we can see that the phenotypes on the extreme ends, they're becoming less common. In the next example, we can see a shift in the frequency of the phenotype to one of the extreme conditions. And then in the last example, we can see a shift away from the majority. So these selection pressures can be caused by or termed as stabilizing selection, directional selection, and disruptive selection, which is also known as diversifying selection. In stabilizing selection, their selection against the extreme phenotypes or alleles, but there's a maintenance or continuity in the population. So an example would be increased mortality of human babies with low birth weight and very large babies in delivery. So when that happens, you've got more and more babies with very, very similar um, birth weight. In directional selection, there's selection against disadvantageous phenotype when environmental pressures are applied, resulting in majority of population evolving advantageous phenotype. So an example of this would be rat with warfarin resistant allele. If they're the ones that survive and reproduce, more and more of the population of the rats will have the warfarin resistant allele. So there's a directional change in selection. And the last one is disruptive selection. And here you're selecting against the middle, which is the mean or the median phenotypes or alleles. And this leads to two distinct populations or a bimodal distribution. So an example would be from Darwin's finches, a small sub subpopulation evolved different phenotypes in different islands. And this is the one that could lead to speciation because the two populations will then become so different to each other that they can't um, breed and produce fertile offspring. So disruptive selection can lead to speciation due to natural selection. And that is the whole of topic eight, origins of genetic variation.